the Lord be with you. We're thankful to hear God's word on this Reformation Sunday when we celebrate the rediscovery of the gospel in the Christian church. Martin Luther was not the first or the only reformer to tell the church leaders and all the Christians that we need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to what God says in the Bible. Especially we're focusing on St. Paul's letter to the Romans in our epistle reading for today, chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul tells the Christians, it is by grace you are saved that God gives you the gift of his righteousness. It comes to us as a gift by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us. It's not what you do. It's not earning your salvation. It, it, it does not depend on you, but it depends on what Christ has done for you that you receive as a gift. That's the discovery. That's the, what the gospel is all about. On the front cover of our bulletin are letters that stand for a Latin phrase, verbum domini manet in aeternum, which means the word of the Lord endures forever. And that is a quotation from the prophet Isaiah. But this is the comfort for us that when God makes promises and when God sent, made the promise to send a savior and sent his son Jesus who died on the cross for us and that by faith in him, we, all our sins are taken away, our death penalty is served and we receive forgiveness and life. That's the gospel. That's the good news that we celebrate always. And that, God's word, endures forever. So let the devil, let the world, let everybody around us rage and storm against the church and against the gospel. But God's word is always going to stand forever, remain forever. And so that's what we celebrate on Reformation Sunday. And we look to God's promises and the sure and certain hope that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's begin now with our opening hymn, which is Martin Luther's famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It is a paraphrase of Psalm 46.
Our service today follows Martin Luther's six chief parts of the Christian faith that he put into his small catechism. We normally, as part of our service, have five out of the six chief parts. We begin always with the remembrance of our baptism into Christ with the invocation. We always have confession and forgiveness. We always uh, say the creed. We always say the Lord's Prayer and Every Sunday here, at Good, or every weekend here at Good Shepherd, we, so, we celebrate the Lord's Supper or the Sacrament of the Altar. Those are five of uh, Luther's six chief parts. The sixth uh, chief part, actually the first in, the, in order, but is the Ten Commandments. And so we also meditate on God's Ten Commandments today, as Luther has simply uh, uh, summarized them for us. And thus we have the whole of the teachings of the Bible uh, summarized in these six chief parts of the Catechism. Let us now begin. God comes to us today the same way our life of faith began when we were baptized. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we come into God's presence, we confess to him that we are unworthy, and we lay our sins before him. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your punishment, now and forever. But I am heartily sorry for them, and I sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. Do you believe that my forgiveness is God's forgiveness? Yes, this we believe. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and shall not be put to shame. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and shall not be put to shame. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. This fear, love, and trust in God should impel us not to despise his word, but learn it, gladly hear it, keep it holy, and honor it. And this is what God commands of us in his word. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. The second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. The third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. The fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. 
What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. The seventh commandment, you shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. The Eighth Commandment. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. The Ninth Commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house, or get it in a way which appear, only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. The Tenth Commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear now the word of the Lord. The first reading for the Reformation of the Christian Church is written in the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the 14th chapter. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join all together in the gradual. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. The epistle reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Roman Christians, the third chapter. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God 
through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What then becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join all together in the verse of the day. Alleluia! Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Alleluia! The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have been, never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If I walked up to you right now and asked you a few questions, do you know how you would answer these questions? Here they are, three questions. Number one, can you explain to me what the gospel is? Number two, what does it mean to be a Christian. Number three, how does a person get to heaven? Think about how you'd answer those questions. I would hope that you wouldn't have any trouble answering those, but the sad truth is many Christians don't really have a good grasp on what the Bible teaches, and so they might find it difficult to try to explain the faith. It often seems like there's a lot of confusion, even among Christians, as to what it means to be a Christian, or even how a person gets to heaven. Well, that was the situation, especially 500 years ago in the Christian church. There was a lot of confusion. The leaders of the Christian church were teaching and preaching things that were only confusing the people, and just about everyone lost sight of the most important and very basic truth of our Christian faith. You might have heard a Christian back then explain, well, if you're good and do all the right things, you go to heaven, and if you're bad, you go to hell. The Bible does speak that way, but you can only speak that way if you understand the heart and center of the Christian faith first. The good and bad thing is not the heart and center. The heart and center is, do you believe in Jesus Christ who died for you? Then we can talk about good and bad. But you might be surprised if I remind you that this is almost word for word what we confess in the Athanasian Creed about the good being good and bad. Whoever has done good will go to heaven. Whoever has done bad will go to hell. We confess that in the Athanasian Creed. You remember we only say it once a year because it's very long, but the basic truth of the Christian faith answers that question. How can we be good and go to heaven? That's what people were confused about 500 years ago. And I think to some extent, or maybe even more so today. Well, that's when Martin Luther came along 500 years ago. He had become a priest, a spiritual leader of God's people, and yet he himself was confused. He just didn't understand about God. It didn't help that he hadn't really read the Bible. He didn't understand why Jesus died, or even that Jesus died for him. And there were lots of things that Martin just didn't get. And he got to the point where he was so frustrated and depressed that he wanted to even kill himself. He said, I hear Jesus tell me, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And I tried to be perfect, but I just can't be good enough. There's still sin and I can't get rid of it. No matter how hard I try, I can't be good. I always end up doing bad things and thinking bad thoughts. And I know that I deserve death and hell because of my sin. I know that God has every right to be angry with me. But then again, how could God expect me to be perfect when he knows that I just can't? That's not fair. And so I've decided 
that I hate God. Young Martin hated God because the way to get to heaven was just way too complicated and he couldn't handle it anymore. He was tired of even trying. He just couldn't do it. And so when Martin explained all this to his superior, the priest over him, his pastor gave him a new assignment. Martin was to study the Bible, the New Testament, and become a professor at the local university. And Martin found that the more he studied the Bible, the more he realized how simple it all is. All this time, Martin had been trying so hard to please God and do what is right, to accomplish the impossible. He was trying so hard to be perfect, or at least righteous, as the Bible calls it, but he just couldn't do it. But then in his Bible studies, he discovered something that helped him, helped him to see the light. He discovered a phrase that lit a light bulb in his mind. And all of a sudden, the Christian faith made sense to him. The phrase Martin discovered was in the passage from Romans 3, our epistle reading for today. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus to all who believe. Now wait a minute, I hear Martin saying. This doesn't sound like God is demanding perfection from me. It sounds more like God is giving me a gift, the gift of his perfection, his righteousness through Jesus. And that's the light bulb that went on, that came on for Martin Luther. The light bulb was, of course, really the Holy Spirit at work in his heart. And all of a sudden, Martin understood. The scriptures were open to him. How does a person get the perfection, the righteousness that God demands? That's the big question. How does a person be good enough to get to heaven? That's what people were confused about 500 years ago, and nobody was actually hearing the gospel. And the answer to the question is not what most people think. You don't get to heaven by doing enough good things. You don't get to heaven by going to church. You don't get to heaven by giving your money to the church. You don't even get to heaven by praying so many times a day. These are all things that the church in Martin Luther's day had been leading people to believe. And I'm afraid that many Christians even think that way today. No, the truth is that no matter what you do, it'll never be good enough to be perfect like God demands from you. No matter how good you are, you can never earn your way into heaven. And so Martin Luther discovered that you can only receive goodness, righteousness, perfection as a gift from God. That's all. It's a gift to be received. Jesus paid for that gift by his death on the cross. And now God gives it to you as an undeserved gift. Grace. We call that. That means you don't deserve it. It's a gift. Being saved, being a Christian, being good or righteous, going to heaven, they're all ways to say the same thing. All these things are not about what we do for God, but it's about what God has done for us. That's the gospel. Now, when you were in preschool or kindergarten or first grade, I dare say you're learning about the world, about the language that we speak, about everything. It began with learning the ABCs. 
And if you learn those ABCs, then you can learn to read, to spell words, to write, to learn all kinds of other things. You could learn to read books and learn about all kinds of topics. This, the learning about the gospel, what God has done for us and gives us as a gift in Christ Jesus, this is the beginning, the ABCs of the Christian faith. This is the first thing you need to understand right here. Jesus died on the cross. He died for you and me. Why? Because God said that whoever sins deserves to die. That death is your death, my death. It means you and I deserve to die because of our sins, because we're not perfect, because we're not righteous. And Jesus died our death for us. And now our penalty for what we deserved is served. Jesus took away all of our sins, took away all the bad stuff that we do, all the times when God wants us to be perfect, but we just can't, we don't measure up. Jesus takes that all away from us. And in exchange, he gives us his perfection, his righteousness, his goodness. Martin Luther called that the happy exchange. We give him our sins and our death, and he gives us his righteousness and his life. What a happy exchange, right? And now we can live forever and never die. Now we can live in heaven with God our Father. Now we are considered his children, his dearly loved children. And it's all because Jesus died for us to take away our sin and to give us his righteousness. So the gift you and I don't deserve, but he gives to us because our God loves us so much, he doesn't want us to die. He wants us to receive his gift of life and live forever with him. Now, I hear so many questions from people like, well, if a baby is born and he dies before the parents get a chance to have him baptized, will that baby go to heaven or go to hell? That's a pretty complicated question, don't you think? How would you answer that? What if a baby dies before having a chance to be baptized, before hearing the good news of Jesus? Well, here's another hard question. If a person from way out in Africa, I suppose, dies without ever hearing the name of Jesus, will he go to hell even though he never had a chance to hear and believe? Boy, that, that's another complicated question, isn't it? How would you answer that one? Well, maybe you've been afraid to share your faith with someone because you might, they might ask you some sort of question like that that you don't know how to answer. Maybe you've never volunteered to teach Sunday school or even an adult class because you can't answer some of the tricky questions that people often ask. So do you want to know how I would answer those tricky questions? I learned this from a professor I had at the seminary who was teaching us how simple the Christian faith is. When someone asks a difficult question, sometimes the best answer is to answer them with a question. Why do you want to know? Do you want to know about the baby who dies before being baptized, whether it'll go to heaven? I say, why do you want to know? Are you planning on not baptizing your baby? All I know is that the Bible says, believe and be baptized and you will be saved. So is it an option not to be baptized? Well, no. Okay, then baptize your son or daughter and teach them that Jesus died on the cross so that they can go to heaven. That's all you need to know. 
if a child dies before you have an opportunity to do that, their life is in God's hands who created them. And he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. How about the person who's never even heard of Jesus? Will God send that person to hell? And I say, why do you want to know? Is there someone that you're planning on not telling about Jesus? Is there someone who needs to know about Jesus and you've been putting off telling them? All I know is that the Bible says there's only one reason why a person is ever condemned to hell, and that is by refusing to accept, to receive the gift that God offers them through Jesus. Outside of that, I can't answer your question. What we need to do, fellow Christians, is to remember the ABCs of our Christian faith. Sing that song, Jesus Loves Me, again to yourself. What more do you need to know? I often say everything I needed to know about the Christian faith I learned when I was two or three years old as, as soon as I could understand. My parents showed me a cross, Jesus dying on the cross, taught me that song, Jesus Loves Me, and I didn't really understand what the cross meant or why I deserved to die or why Jesus died for me, but I at least knew that basic point. Jesus died for you so that you can live. And even as a little toddler, that was enough for me to understand. And it would take me my entire life to grow up to, to understand more about what that really means. And I'm still learning. What more does your friend or neighbor need to know? There's nothing more. Tell them Jesus died so that they don't have to. They don't need to be afraid of death because God has taken away their death in Christ. They'll only be sleeping. When they believe in Jesus, then there is no more death. Death has been defeated. We have a home in heaven forever with the Lord. But if you don't know that, if you don't believe that, then death must be scary. It is a frightening thing. But so many times we make it so much more complicated than it needs to be. The Christian faith, what Jesus has done for us, how we go to heaven. That's why St. Paul says, I've resolved to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's really all you need to know. Everything else comes from that. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and me. That's the beginning and the end of our faith. Start at the cross, and whatever else you learn about the Christian faith, make sure that it brings you right back to the cross. That's all you need to know. Let's not make it more complicated than that. It's the simple truth that sets us free. It's the simple truth that the world needs to hear. Let's remember the ABCs of our Christian faith. Amen. And now may God's peace, which goes beyond all that we can understand, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue with the Apostles' Creed. God himself has revealed and opened to us the most profound depth of his fatherly heart, his sheer unutterable love. He created us for this very purpose, to redeem us and make us holy. God gives himself completely to us with all his gifts and power. The Father gives us all creation, Christ gives us all his works, and the Holy Spirit gives us all his gifts. Let us then speak together of our loving God, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends in Christ, since we are here assembled in the name of the Lord, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God, to pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and graciously promised to hear us. O God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy out on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace so that your holy name may be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is being blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant us our daily bread, preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us to trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil, of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you enable all those who earnestly desire these things to say from their very hearts, Amen, trusting without any doubt that our prayers are truly answered in heaven, as you have promised. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you shall receive it, and you will. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.